I'm here today bringing you a message from Jesus. For our Lord is the Word, and He lived among us. And the, and the Word of God says that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that you have not been born again of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. So today, I am here bringing you a message from our Lord. The topic our Lord wanted to talk about today is effective prayer. This is going to begin a brand new series with the Living Word. It's going to be quite a few episodes. Today we're going to begin with prayer for leaders. But you'll learn a lot about effective prayer anyways. The first thing we must know and realize is that God never changes. His ways are always the same. We see this throughout the Word of God. You see, Israel had a lamb they had to sacrifice every year to remain in right relationship with God, to be righteous before God. It was a lamb that they sacrificed for their sins, for the whole nation. And Jesus is our lamb. He is the lamb of God. He gave himself willingly so that our sins could be atoned for through his sacrifice. So keeping this in mind, we should be looking at the Old Testament as well as the New to see how God handled things with his people. The Old Testament indeed is good for us to look at. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3 um, 16, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. So this makes it clear in, in 2 Timothy that scriptures, that was the Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament at that time, so it was, that was the Old Testament. It's good for us to look at. So much of what we're looking at today will come from what we call the Old Testament, or Timothy calls scriptures. But to begin with, we're going to look at prayer in the New Testament. Is it important for us to pray? And what makes uh, our prayers effective? In James 5, verse 16 he mentions the power of prayer. You see, it's mentioned 99 times in the New Testament. 99 times prayer is mentioned. So we should pay attention to it. Here's James 5, 16. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. That's James uh, in the Amplified Classic Version. There are two things that we must learn from this. For a prayer to be effective, it has to be earnest. It has to be heartfelt. You must mean it. You must be um, determined in it. Your heart must line up with what you're saying. It can't just be words of your mouth. Also, it says of a righteous man. This means we must be in a right standing or righteous before God. Now, that comes through Jesus, but there's also more that we've learned about. Remember, our last series was called Loving Jesus, Loving God, and we found out that if we love him, we will obey him. So there, to remain righteous and in right standing with God, we have to be willing to obey him. So let's continue on now and look at prayer for, let's start at the top. We're going to start at the top of the chain. Who is it important to pray for? Well, at the top are leaders. We must pray for our leaders according to the New Testament. Let's look at that in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, then, I admonish and urge and urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. For kings, see the first person he lists are kings, and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility, 
that outwardly we may pass quiet and undisturbed life and inwardly a peace, peaceable one in godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good and right, and it is pleasing to our God, our Savior. To God, our Savior. This is in the Amplified Classic Version, and you see that it is good for us to pray for those who are in authority over us, for leaders that should be the first thing that we pray for. Now, not all of us, I should say, not many of us nowadays have leaders who we feel are good leaders. We have many that we feel are bad or even downright evil. How many of you in your country, right, right where you are, feel that your leader, hmm, it's not the most godly or even Wow, they're not really doing things that are good for the people of this nation. How many of you, got, of you guys feel that way? If you do, feel free to comment on this video and wherever you find it. And let us know which country you're in. Because I would be interested in knowing how many people feel that their leaders are good, are not good, or are they don't really know. So, unknown. Because it, I would like to do a little bit of a poll. So how many of you guys think that your leader is not the greatest, right? Not, per, not very good. We don't want to talk bad about them, but we can't say, nope, my leader, hmm, it doesn't, you know, doesn't seem to be doing what is best, I feel, for the country and for Christians in particular. Even though we have leaders that are good and, or bad, there's ways we can pray effectively for them. But first, we need to learn a little bit more about leaders according to the Word of God so we can play, pray rightly. We, don't, we want to pray effective prayers. We want to pray according to the Word of God. So let's see what we can pray or what God says about leaders. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. This talks about an evil leader, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was empowered by God to rule the most of the known world. He, was, he conquered a whole bunch of people. But then he forgot who put him there and became huh, boastful. And God called him to the carpet. And so here is what God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he wills and sets, it, sets up over it the basest of men. You see, God is in charge of leaders who leads where? All the countries, your country and my country. The leader is determined by God. No matter how they get there, whether it is through a rebellion, through a revolution, through a crooked election, any of those things. It doesn't say that God places leaders except for if you happen to rig an election, except for if, you know, this has come, come through a revolution. No, no matter who the leader is, God put them there. So let's look a little more at that. Daniel 2 verses um, 20 and 21 Daniel answered, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. He sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. You see, God allows bad rulers to come, and he also removes rulers and places new ones over them. But why? Why? What determines the ruler in your country? Are you curious to find out why the leader in your country may not be so great? May be not um, helping Christians, may not be um, kind towards, towards people. Let's look at how bad rulers come into a position in any country. 
Jeremiah 18, verses 7 and 8. At one time I suddenly speak concerning a nation or a kingdom, that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if the people of that nation concerning which I have spoken turn from their evil, I will revent, relent and reverse my decision concerning that evil that I have thought to do them. Look at that. Leaders come in according to God, God's will. Sometimes he puts a leader in that is very destructive for a country, that is meant to be destructive for a country. And it's because of evil. They must turn from their sin. If the majority of the hearts of men are evil, God will place an evil person over leadership in his own time. Remember in Israel, they had they went away from God, worshipped other idols, did all kinds of horrible things, sometimes for hundreds of years before God brought in um, somebody to destroy them, some, uh, somebody else to rule over them harshly. So your country may have been going away from God for a long time, but there comes a point when God says, enough is enough. Now I'm going to put, give you the leader that you deserve. And now I'm going to put a leader over you because the hearts of the men are not, are towards evil. You see, the time to act and pray is not right before an election, right before somebody new comes into power. It's not, it's sooner than that. We have to see where we have gone astray as a nation. Only then can we receive a good leader who will, will be of great benefit to the country. So if we have a not great leader, if that leader has come in by a crooked method, what should we do? Should we rebel against leaders? Should we, should we say horrible things against them? Well, let's look at Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every person be loyal, be loyally subject to the governing civil authorities. For there is no authority except from God by his permission, by his sanction. And those that exist do so by God's appointment. Therefore, he who resists and set himself up against the authorities resists what God has appointed and arranged in divine order. And those who resist will bring down judgment upon themselves, receiving the penalty due them. Look at that. If we resist and rebel against authorities, that even if we think that they're not great people, if they're doing things that aren't great for the country, if we set ourselves up against them, we're actually rebelling against God, against his will. So we have to be careful how we pray for leaders. In Romans 13 verses 4 and 5, it speaks more about God putting leaders over us and what the purpose is. It says, he is God's servant to execute his wrath, his punishment, his vengeance on the wrongdoer, the sinner. Therefore, one must be sub subject not only to avoid God's wrath and to escape punishment, but also as a matter of principle and for the sake of consciousness. So this was said in Romans, in the New Testament. Do you remember what was going on when this was written? They were crucifying Christians. It was not a good scene. Remember, we hear about all kinds of bad things that were happening in Rome. But Paul is saying we must obey the leadership unless they are telling you to worship another god. That's the one, the one thing you cannot do. If they're commanding you to sin... You don't obey it. You obey God, God's Ten Commandments. First and primary, do not worship any God. Do not worship anything but God. Wanted to point that out real quick. Okay, so let's continue. And here is in First Peter, another New Testament example. First Peter 2, 13, and 14, 13 through 14. Be submissive to every human institution and authority for the sake of the Lord. Whether it be an emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to bring vengeance, punishment, justice to those who do wrong and to encourage those who do good service. 
we are encouraged to obey, obey the authorities in the land over us. So let's look a little bit more about how we get those wrong, that or not, we shouldn't say wrong, they're right according to God, but we might feel, gosh, this is a, not a great leader. They're doing harm to our country. They're doing harm to our rights. They're doing harm to, you know, a lot of different things. Let's look at the reasons why God does it specifically. This again is in Romans. Let's go all the way back to Romans 1, verses 26 and 27. We're going to spend some time in Roman, Romans because we know the Roman Empire was known as being exceedingly bad, right? The, the, their, they had a lot of sin. And so let's see why God put a bad ruler there or what we would consider a not great person as a ruler. Romans 1, 21 through 22 shows us why they come. Because when they knew and recognized him as God, they did not honor and glorify him as God or give him thanks. But instead, they became futile and godless in their thinking with vain imaginings, foolish reasonings and stupid speculations. And their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. This is why it how it begins. This is how a nation gets more and more down that slippery slope into sin that eventually leads to bad, having bad rulers appointed over them, having rulers that are going to do harm, that are going to punish people, bring God's wrath. Because they didn't recognize, honor, and glorify God. Does your country honor God? What goes in, on in your country? Is there idolatry? Do they worship other gods? Do they not acknowledge or honor God at all? Do the majority of people spend any time at all focused on God and his will? Or is there, are they more focused on things of sin, idolatry, witchcraft, adultery? Let's look at the, at what, how that slippery slope happens, how that that inclination to sin and why sin comes. We're going to go to, we're going to continue in Romans. I'm going to skip a couple of verses for time's sake, but you can read the whole thing. Romans 1, we're going all the way through 30, 1, 21 through 30. This is 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them over and abandoned them to vile affections and degrading passions. For their women exchanged their natural function for an unnatural and abnormal one. The men also turned from their natural relations with women and were set ablaze, burning, consumed with lust for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and suffering in their own bodies and personalities the inevitable consequences and penalty for their wrongdoing and going astray, which was their fitting retribution. So, how many of you are aware that our God's rainbow has been reappointed to something exceedingly sinful, just like they're pointing out here, right? LGBTQ is not according to God's ways at all. And, it, and it's grown and, and gained strength because the majority of, of the men and women, mankind in a country, in countries are not honoring and glorifying God. They're not seeking God. They're not trying to be, to learn his ways, to function in his ways. And because of that, because they're not honoring him, they're giving, not giving him the gravity, the, the reverence that he deserves. God has turned them over to their affections of one another. Remember what Rome was known for? They were known for their, their uh, leaders, not even being able to procreate rightly. <laughs> sometimes because they, they were, mm, let's just leave it there. They had some issues. Is that not what this, our world is about? How many movies, how many television shows have this abnormal, what the Bible calls abnormal, not natural function? Now I'm telling you, if it was normal, the human race would die out, right? The majority of people 
have to have affections for the, se for the opposite sex or else there wouldn't be any babies. So this is wrong. And this sin has come in, but we shouldn't necessarily point our finger at the people who have fallen into this. Remember, some, a, a small percentage, are born that way. And they're born that way because of the sin of the nation that has been going on for generations. They are suffering the penalty of our sin, of our willful um, ignore, ignoring or ignorance, ignoring God. Because we're ignoring God, because our country has for so many years, they get to be born with a sinful way of looking at the, the humanity. It's a sad thing. It's a so sad. We shouldn't condemn them. We shouldn't point our finger at them. We should know, my gosh, we have failed. We as a society have failed because this is on the rise. Now, here's how it begins. So often the Bible tells us the end at the beginning. So we have to keep reading. Romans 1, 28 through 30, it shows us how we get to that point of of the abnormal affections of mankind, of the lust being turned in a wrong direction. Romans 1, 28 through 30 says, And so, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, see, they're not acknowledging God, or approve of him, or consider him worth knowing, they are not seeking God, they're not seeking his ways, he gave them over to base and condemned minds, to do things not proper or decent, but loathsome, until they were filled, they were saturated with every kind of unrighteousness, with iniquity, that's continued and glorifying sin, grasping and covetous greed. How many of you are in a nation where you can't trust what's being said because they're scheming and maniving, it's all about greed, right? They... And they also have malice. So covetous, greed, and malice. They're full of envy, jealousy, murder, strife, deceit, treachery, ill will, and cruel ways. They are secret backbiters, gossipers, slanderers. They hateful and too in hating God. How many countries do, can you see there's a lot of hatred of God and of those who are Christians? How many programs on TV, uh, this has been going on for decades now, at least two decades that I know, where they make Christians out to be stupid, ignorant, they're overly, they put forth the word of God in the worst possible way. They, they make Christians look like these horrible, horrible people. How many of you see that in our media? That's because they're hateful too and hating God. You see, they're full of insolence, arrogance, boasting, inventors of new forms of evil, and disobedient and undutiful to parents. Does this list not just perfectly describe your country, my country, the countries around the world where even Christians, remember we talked about this, even Christians are not seeking God in his ways. Going to church is not enough. Remember, we talked about in the last series, the Loving God series, that the Bible shows us that certain church are not teaching rightful, he, rightfully God's ways. And they're going to come under correction and horrible things. Go back and listen to that. Check it out. See what kind of church you're going to. Do you want consequences or do you want benefits? You need to see the benefits of loving God. And now you can see that there are consequences when a country doesn't obey God. When a country is, they hate God, hateful too. They're refusing to acknowledge God in his ways, to consider him worth getting to know. The big key here is what can we do about it now? Yes, we can pray for leaders, but we should be doing this other part. If you want a good leader in your nation, you should start doing these things. First of all, do not celebrate sin. Oh, I forgot to get the scripture on that. There is a scripture that says, do not 
um, walk with sin and others. I'll do that next. I'll do that tomorrow because we're going to continue on tomorrow. And I'm going to give you actual prayers to pray. But the big thing is don't judge them, but don't celebrate their sin. Tend to your own life first. So you should never, ever be celebrating anything. LGBTQ, never. You should not be associated with it as a Christian. And you can't celebrate sin at all. But tend to your own life. Don't be pointing your finger. Yes, it's all their fault. Everybody else is at fault. No, tend to your life. So God can use you in your country right where you are. Here's Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why do you behold the mote, the small splinter that is in your brother's eye? But consider not the whole beam, the big plank sticking out of your own eye. Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the mote out of your eye. And behold, the beam is in your eye. You hypocrite, first cast out the beam from your own eye. Then you shall see clearly to cast out the moat of your brother's eye. You see, we must first attend to our own life. Are you seeking God? Are you learning his ways? Are you applying them to your life? Do you consider God worth knowing, worth getting to know? As a Christian, you are part of a whole new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Your citizenship has been transferred from this world to another one. Have you been getting to know the ways of your kingdom? Are you willing to walk in them? Are you submitting to Jesus as your Lord, your owner, your master? Do this first. Then God can use you to touch the hearts and men around you. If every Christian will learn his ways and walk in them, it'll give you opportunities to be a witness for God to use you in so many ways just small ones, but if every Christian is is walking in God's ways, learning how to listen to him, being able to hear from the Holy Spirit, being used by him, if every Christian can, can really minister to or witness to just two or three others, two or three others in their life, and if that everyone did that, it would multiply exponentially. But first, attend to your own life. Can you hear from your counselor, your guide, the Holy Spirit? The last, the last uh, course or the last uh, series on loving God talked about our gift, the Holy Spirit, and how it's important that we are able to talk to him, hear from him. Are you willing to learn God's ways, to get to know him? Well, praise the Lord. He did have us create a free online school. You do it at your own pace. There are people you can contact and talk to about the materials if you don't understand them. And wherever you are, it can minister to you. We have the beginning and opening, the life of Jesus, where we walk you through the gospel so you can get to know your Lord, know Jesus and what he has for you. We have um, courses on the courts of heaven a cor- that will help you understand how the kingdom of heaven operates, your place in it, what you should do and not do. So I hope that you will begin learning. I hope that you will consider God worthy of getting to know his ways, get to know him. That is what our Lord wanted you to know today. If you want a better leader, it's time to get started now. Don't wait until there's until a new one's being set to be take over. No, no, you don't want to wait six months before it's time to get a new leader. Start now. Next, tomorrow, we will talk about the effective prayer, how to pray for both good leaders and bad leaders, how, to make, how your prayers can be effective. So we'll go over all that tomorrow. But today, I hope you have learned why you have the leader that you do, how not to rebel against the leader. You better be in agreement with God. If, if things are going badly because of your leader, well, that's God's wrath being poured out. But there is a way 
there is a way that you can be kept from it. Remember, pray for your leaders so that all will be well with you. Your country can be suffering through all kinds of stuff, but your life can be secure in God if you will pray for your leaders. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Let's pray as we end today. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you today for revealing through your word that you are in control. No matter what leader we have, you place them there. There's no one can, can come in and overthrow your power. You placed the leader there, no matter how they got into office. So we will honor them as the leader of our nation. We will not speak against them. Matter of fact, follow me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me. Forgive me for any wrong words I have spoken against the man, woman, whomever you have placed in charge of my country. I realize now that that leader was placed by you under your authority and that rebelling and speaking against him is speaking against you. David would not raise his hand against Saul, the leader who was possessed by demons, even though Saul tried to kill him because he knew that you placed Saul in charge and he was not going to rebel against you. So help us be like David. If we have raised up our voice against our leaders, forgive us. Forgive us for coming into wrong agreement against the leader. We realize you have placed them there. And if your wrath is being car carried out by this country, so be it. We submit to you today, Father. We submit to you and your authority, knowing that you are in control. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you bring each person wisdom concerning this message. Let them ponder and consider it. Consider the words that are from you. Let them take fertile ground in their hearts. Let them bring forth much fruit. Holy Spirit, I place each person in your hands. You are our teacher, our guide, our ultimate authority. And we know we should never rebel against authority unless you tell us to. Unless you say God is removing this person. Then we'll get on board. Until then, Holy Spirit, we submit to you. Speak loudly to us if there's anything that we are to do. For we will submit to leaders so that all will be well with us. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray these things. Amen. That is our message today. I can't wait to see you next week where we learn the effective way to pray for leaders. Until then. <laughs>